Okay. Um, this is a piece of Vermont granite that's been um, machined into a compact tension specimen to do a fracture mechanics test. Uh, basically, if this was a piece of steel or, or nickel alloy or something, it would be machined the same. You have two holes to grab it in the machine, and you uh, machine a slot, and there is a particular aspect ratio you have to have as to the depth of the notch to the uh, depth of the whole specimen. The biggest ones of these in steel I've ever seen are kind of like this big, a compact tension specimen for maybe a 10-inch thick piece of steel. You, have, you end up with something that's you know, basically scale the size of this to 10 inches thick rather than one inch thick. This actually I retrieved from uh, Wendell Wilkening who was finishing his doctoral thesis here um, uh, as I was starting as an assistant professor. And uh, this was one of his specimens that he didn't test, but he made a number of these. His, the purpose of his thesis was to figure out why the Egyptian obelisks exist. Because if you, uh, if you take a piece of granite and back in the mid-70s with what we know about the fracture mechanics and the fracture toughness of, of granite, these uh, granite obelisks, if they, obviously they had to have built them, carved them in the flat position, right? and they had to raise them up to a vertical position. And what we knew about the, the defect sizes on the surface, remember glass can be very brittle, right? You just score the surface and it'll snap. What we knew about their ability to finish the surfaces um, back in, you know, three or 4,000 BC or whatever, um, and the fracture toughness, you never should have been able to lift them up without their snapping in two, okay? Uh, at least that's what we knew 25 years ago. After uh, uh, Wink, we call him, when Dr. Wilkening uh, finished his doctoral thesis, we learned that the reason granite actually ends up being tougher than we thought is because it forms a bunch of little cracks ahead of the main crack. And those little cracks absorb energy. And since then, people have basically tried to use that as a way to quote unquote toughen ceramics. Because, you know, stone's basically just a complex ceramic composite. So this is a fracture toughness specimen, if you want to look at that. Um, uh, the, and fracture toughness testing like that's been around for 35 years. Um, the, uh, the one that's been around for about 100 years is Sharpie testing. In Sharpie testing, you take a one square centimeter steel bar by 10 centimeters, I think it's 10 centimeters long, um, and you put a two millimeter notch machined in the surface with a fairly closely controlled radius. Um, I think it's a tenth of a millimeter radius or something on the end. You, you um, want to know what the toughness of the steel is as a function of temperature because steel changes its toughness with temperature. And so you put this in a machine uh, that has a great big, it's just a great big pendulum, great big hammer, and it's a calibrated hammer. It has a, a little dial on it. I mean, you know, how fancy a machine we're going to make in 1900, right? And they have this, this hammer comes down. You put this, take this thing out of the, the water bath or the ice bath, the uh, carbon dioxide bath or, or the liquid nitrogen, whatever you're cooling it down with. And you put it in the, the machine and within a second or two, you drop this hammer on it and the hammer of pendulum swings down. And if it takes a big whack, and you can see where the, the what they call the top, T-U-P, head of the hammer hit this thing, and embedded itself, if it hits something that absorbs lots of energy, it kind of stops and the dial doesn't go up as far. If you get a brittle, and this is only half of one, you put a brittle piece of steel in there and the pendulum, it's like nothing's there. And you can get down as low as, well, they measure in foot pounds. This one stopped the 240 foot pound uh, hammer. This one probably was around five foot pounds or something. Okay, it's very brittle, no deformation. This one's deformed um, and didn't even completely break in two. You don't like them to stop the hammer because you have to recalibrate the machine every time you do that officially. Um, it costs four or five hundred dollars to re recalibrate the machine because you have to uh, use standard specimens and break some standard specimens that you can purchase from the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. They used to make them over here to Watertown Arsenal. The Army had responsibility for fracture toughness testing, but um, Back when uh, they decided the military couldn't do anything except military-related things, they got out of the business and gave it to 
National Bureau of Standards. Um, this is a ductile uh, tensile specimen. It turns out a ductile tensile specimen could be just as brittle as that impact specimen. Um, because steel can, can have a very big strain rate effect. If you hit it fast with a notch in it, it's not, it's not sensitive, it'll appear brittle. If you have a nice smooth specimen and you pull it slowly, it may actually yield and deform, even though if it got hit rapidly, it would, it would shatter. So there's a typical cup and cone. And I actually didn't have a good fatigue specimen in, in my office. Actually, I do. Or no, I, I just sent it back. Uh, but in any case, uh, this is a brittle fracture. This is basically just a piece of silicon. This is a silicon single crystal that was grown. It wasn't any good. So anyway, it was laying around a lab around here. And I asked if I could have it. Um, some students like it. It's, it's nice and shiny. It's one person said, right? Uh, it's lots of light. Um, there's a uh, professor here who's basically working with a company trying to see if they can't do something to make silicon less brittle because it would be a wonderful lightweight structural material. Not necessarily a single crystal, but just if you could make silicon less brittle. I don't know if they've succeeded in doing that, but that's what they're trying to do. Okay, any questions on any of that? Um, so we want to wrap up some of the material selection. Material selection is multifaceted. You got to worry about uh, lots of different parameters. And one of the problems with most material scientists, they say, oh, look, I just optimized this parameter for this material. Well, OK, what about if I'm a designer, I'm not interested in just one parameter. Strength may be important, but I'm also interested in toughness. I mean, if it, if it shatters when I look at it, then I don't want to make a structure, a critical structure out of it. I may also be interested in its machinability, or its recyclability, or its repairability, um, or its corrosion resistance. Uh, there are lots of different things that a designer has to worry about. One of the main problems with material scientists is they're so excited when they get an uh, improvement in one material, in one property, they say, oh, this is going to solve the world's problems. And the designers just kind of sit back and say, oh, thanks. you know." And that's why you get these quotes from, from people who actually have to use it like Bob Sprague, who says, whenever you first hear about the properties of a new, new material, write it down, because those are the best properties the material will ever possess. And that's because someone worked very hard to optimize one parameter, and basically they gave up on all the other parameters. But when a designer is actually going to use it, they have to kind of, it's trade-offs in how you process and, and whatnot. Uh, structural materials are strongly influenced by cost. And that's not true of what we call functional materials. Functional materials are things like gallium ars arsenide, or silicon, or uh, um, um, uh, optical fibers, OK? They have a function that they're performing, and they're not carrying a weight. In fact, optical fibers have got something else to carry the load. You don't want them to break. So you basically put some structural material around them. But uh, so functional materials tend to be very, very can be very, very pricey, particularly if you can get a lot of function out of a very small uh, amount of them, like a piece of silicon. Um, the problem with structural materials is you structures usually have to be of a certain critical size. If I want to go across the Harvard Bridge, which is 364 smoots, right? You know, a, a bridge that's 200 smoots doesn't give me a whole lot of, do me a whole lot of good, unless I want to swim the rest of the way. Okay? It really has to be a certain size. Um, you know, a, a, uh, a 40 story building has to be a certain size. It takes a certain amount of material to make that. I can't make it out of silicon chips, even though they have tremendous function. Okay, and so when, who, who was it? Bush's or Reagan's advisors said, you know, silicon chips, computer, chi computer chips, uh, potato chips, they're all the same. Okay. You know, uh, but there are people who, who don't worry about such things. Um, so structural materials, because we use them in large quantity, are very, very sensitive to cost. And we've talked about the cost bogeys for different types of vehicles. An automobile is $2 a pound. An aircraft is around $200 a pound. And a spacecraft, it can be $20,000 a pound. So when people talk about, I have a wonderful new material, and it only costs $10,000 a pound, then you know it only has one application, and that's in spacecraft, if it's a structural material. Or 
you can consider diamond a structural material. And it costs about a half a million dollars a pound for industrial diamond. It's a structural material, but I'm not going to use it in a large quantity. I'm going to make a composite and only use it. In a sense, diamond almost becomes a structural material, a, a functional material. You're using it for its mechanical properties, and so it's often included as structural materials, but you're really using it as a functional material, something that doesn't wear out, okay, usually. I keep on coming back to steel um, and say that it's unique among all materials in combination of cost, strength, toughness, fabricability, repairability, recyclability, and a whole host of other things. Um, and sometimes people criticize me for, for playing up steel so much, uh, but in fact, I've been doing it for 15 years, and I used to sort of be a poster child for the American Institute of Steel Construction and the uh, American Iron Steel Institute and stuff. I once had to go and give a talk uh, where I talked about the future of metals, where I talked about the importance of steel. The steel industry basically is, is sort of, has, doesn't have a very high self-esteem because they've been losing money for so long. And people tell them that they're a dirty old smokestack industry. Um, that's true, they are dirty old smokestack industry, but any third world country that has resources of coal or iron ore wants to own one of those smokestack industries because it is fundamental to getting from being a third world country to an industrialized nation. Um, what did Japan do after World War II? You know, they didn't, in the, in the 70s, they became a great shipbuilding country, but in the, that's because in the 60s, they became a steel maker, and they had the steel to make the ships out of. Okay, so the shipbuilding industry depended, there was a synergy between the, sh the shipbuilding industry and the steel industry in Japan. Um, since you use a lot of steel, and it turns out 95% of all metal made in the world is steel, so I mean, it's not, this is not a, it's a revelation to other people that steel is such a large fraction of all, all the metal made. But it is, in fact, a fact, and that's the reason it's a fact is because of this use, unique combination of properties. It has, you can get some of the highest strengths, not the highest strengths, but to get higher strengths than you can get in steel, you're typically going from something steel at 40 cents a pound or maybe a dollar a pound for really expensive steel. Uh, you're going to something that might cost $30 a pound. So it's a big price differential to exceed the strength of steel. And you can get things that have higher toughness than steel. But again, you're getting price differentials that are more than an order of magnitude. So um, steel is kind of neat in that sense. Um, it has some, a few things have higher toughness, but steel can give you some of the best toughness. For those, all those reasons, it's, uh, it is the material of choice. And I, I remember back in the, the late 80s, I used to go to Detroit when I was doing some work on spot welding of cars. And I, I'd give talks at General Motors or, or Ford or whatever, and I'd point out that steel was still going to be the material of choice 10 years later in the automotive industry, and you wouldn't have, um, cars wouldn't be made out of aluminum 10 years later. And I used to get a lot of flack from a lot of people, particularly Alcoa, um, <clears throat> but for saying that. And until I had a student work at Chrysler on the Chrysler Neon in the early 90s, about 93 or 94, I used to make bets with groups of four or five hundred people because I, you know, I'd give some talk and I'd talk about how important steel was and its, its cost and it gets down to this, this thing I said before. If the material cost is only 20% of the value of the fabricated final structure and you can, the value of the final, final structure is only two dollars a pound which is the value of an automobile over the life of the vehicle. You know, you can work all these things out kind of on a macroscopic, macroeconomic, macroscopic level. That means you can't afford to pay more than 40 cents a pound for your underlying material. And that's why they were using 50 cent a pound adhesives in the early 80s in the automotive industry because they were used to using cheap material. And then they ran into problems and now they actually pay, pay 10 bucks a pound or 12 bucks a pound for adhesives. But they don't like it okay, because they got to get something cheaper. So if it's $2 a pound value and only one-fifth of the value can be the raw material in, in, in coming cost, you can't afford to pay more than 40 cents a pound. It's a very simple calculation. Uh, and so I used to go around and people, you know, I give this talk and I'd get people question and answers at the end 
uh, and people would attack me for being such a Neanderthal. And I'd say, I, I will place a bet with you right now. I'll bet you $10,000 that 10 years from now, we'll still be riding around in steel automobiles. Okay? And here it is. No one ever took me up on the bet, by the way. Okay? Um, it always is nice when these, these demagogues start attacking you to just throw a bet out on them. Throw a challenge out to them, okay? And they wither, okay? Um, but uh, it turns out that no one ever took me up on the bet, but here it is 10, 12 years later, and you go and see how many cars out there are aluminum. Well, the only all aluminum cars are the luxury cars, and anybody who can afford to pay $50,000 for a car doesn't have to worry about what they pay for gasoline, okay? They're buying performance. They're not buying the cheapest possible car. But the average person wants to buy a car for fifteen to $25,000. And you can't make that vehicle out of aluminum today, and you won't be able to do it until we go to 4 or $5 a gallon gasoline. Now, you can say, well, they have $5 a gallon gasoline in certain parts of Europe. So why don't they make all aluminum cars in Europe? Because they want to export to the United States, right? And they couldn't compete in the United States. So they're going to make their people drive around in heavier cars because they want to sell over here. You can't design a car for aluminum and then design another one, same one, in steel. That's too expensive to do that. So it's, it's, uh, uh, we really do control a lot of the world's economics. Okay. Um, which irritates some people. Um, Okay, I want to talk a little bit about casting. Uh, so we finished material selection. I'm going to go into material fabrication and go all the way back. And most of what I'm going to talk about is metals fabrication. If you're really interested in a good ceramics course or polymer course, you should take one of those. Um, but uh, <laughs> you already know about casting of ingots. We talked about the Libra tail, tail shaft failure, and you had this whole piping defect because of the shrinkage during solidification. Most metals shrink on solidification. Aluminum is about 6%. Steel, I think, is about 4%. Uh, anybody know what silicon is? Silicon is actually positive. Silicon is just like water. In fact, everything in that column of the periodic table, well, not everything, carbon doesn't melt at atmospheric pressure, but silicon and germanium and bismuth expand on solidification. And that's because they have somewhat covalent bonding, and the covalent bonds have become rigid. It's when they, the bonds are flexible that they actually can de pack more densely in the liquid state. Same type of thing as water. Okay, But here is a, I don't know, I picked this up out of the lab. This is actually some sort of solder alloy, or actually maybe a bismuth alloy, but it, it did shrink on solidification. You can see the shrinkage on the top. This is um, an aluminum casting. I don't remember where I got this. In fact, this may have been one of Professor Backoff's old samples. This one, I, the casting actually had a breakout when it was solidifying and everything, uh, uh, some of the liquid left inside uh, leaked out. However, if you don't feed the casting properly, and the, this thing does have, will have risers on the casting to feed the liquid in, and so the last part to solidify still has a head of liquid above it. In fact, in a great big ingot, an ingot is just a great big kind of cylindrical or rectangular casting. The top is going to be the thing where the pipe forms, okay, where the shrinkage is. And you want that to be the last thing to solidify. You also want to get, be able to take it out of the mold. So typically, ingots have a nice uh, 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 sloped surface to them or tapered, tapered walls. And actually, where is it? If I went back to... Our, uh, our ingots from the lever thing. Let me find it quickly. There you go. So here are the ingots from the lever, or not from the lever, but ingots. This is out of making, shaping, and treating of steel. This one actually has a reverse taper because they actually push it out the bottom. We'll we don't need to get into that. So does that one. But basically, you want it tapered on the sides. These have a uh, positive taper. These two have negative tapers. This area up here is called the hot top. 
or the riser. And you want the liquid up here to be the last stuff to solidify to feed the shrinkage as this thing shrinks from the inside, um, or it solidifies from the outside in, and as the material shrinks, you want to have something feed it. And so there is a lot of technology that goes into a complex casting. This is just a simple cylinder or rectangular uh, uh, section. When you have a complex casting, to feed it properly requires a little bit of, uh, uh, in the old days, it was kind of an art. Today, we actually have computer programs that can calculate the heat flow in complex three-dimensional structures and tell us how to feed things so I don't end up with some big pour in the middle of the casting. However, um, castings have the problem that they tend to have defects. And those defects, casting flaws, are generally going to be proportionate to the size of the casting. So you saw the LNG Libra, and it had a football size defect, which is, you know, let's say it's one tenth the diameter of the original casting. And that's certainly possible to have a tenth the diameter. If you look at those, uh, that little casting pass around, and you look at the, the surface uh, depression, it's about one tenth the thickness of that little casting. The smaller the casting, the smaller the defects. The bigger the casting, <coughs> the bigger the defects. And in fact, if I go to a big heavy plate, even today, uh, big heavy plates like eight, ten inches thick still have to be made by ingot technology. Um, in the 1960s, the Japanese steel industry switched to continuous casting, and it has the advantage that you're continuously drawing the steel off, and so your hot top, you don't have a hot top. Basically, you have to cut that hot top off. In an ingot, for a plate material, if you have a heavy plate, one-third of the weight of the cast steel goes back for remelting because the hot top consumes one-third of the weight. It's about half the height of the bottom, and it's only about 50% dense, so it's got about one-third of the material, okay, in the total casting. So you've lost, you're down to 67% to utilization of your, your melted metal in a uh, ingot casting of a plate. Um, and in fact, after you roll the plate and crop the ends and square it off, typical plate yields from ingot casting are 50%. You get, you get, you get, one pound of saleable product for every two pounds of melted metal. In continuous casting, you can just keep pouring in and you have this, this mold without a bottom, it's a water-cooled copper mold that kind of vibrates and you start out with a plate on the bottom and you cast it and then you, you lower the plate and the steel is hot and you curve it. And these buildings are maybe uh, 10 stories tall, but you curve the steel plate and you've, you've got some handouts that show you this through these rollers and then you cut it off. And so you could be solidifying this thing continuously at a few inches or, or up to a foot a minute, typically. Depends on the size of the casting. About 90 to 95% of all steel made today is continuous cast. But if it's going to, the thickest continuous casters are 10 to 12 inches thick. Otherwise, you can't get the heat out fast enough. It's kind of an optimum there. Um, so any plate that's going to have good quality in thick plate is going to have to be cast by some other technology. So you're talking about plate greater than four inches thick. Remember to close up those defects by cold welding or even hot welding, you got to get 75% deformation. If I get 75% get deformation in a 12 inch plate, that means I can only roll three inch plates. I got to get 75% deformation before I, before I close up and weld together to forge the, uh, the casting defects that could be there. Well, continuous casting, you might be able to do a little bit better because you don't have as big a defect um, because of the geometry. But nonetheless, ingot casting is still around. If I go to the ASTM spec for ultrasonic inspection of steel plates, heavy steel plates, the tightest specification I can call out says that any flaw that I find with my ultrasonic detector has to fit within a six inch diameter circle. That's a pretty good size flaw, right? But if, if it fits within a six inch diameter circle on my ultrasonic test, you can ship it. That's the highest level of quality you can get for heavy plates. Yeah, yeah that's for plates six inches and thicker, okay?
No, for thinner plates, no. Okay. Thinner plate, it's going to be proportional to the size of the product, is, is the point I'm trying to make. So if I have a one inch plate, yeah, I could probably have flaws that are the size of a dime in a one inch plate if I did an ultrasonic test. Fortunately, these flaws in the plate, if it's got a lot of rolling in it, are tend to be along the seams in the same plane as the plate, and that's not usually the loading direction. You're not usually loading through the thickness. So they're not oriented in a harmful way. But there's defects like that in any plate. There's defects like that in any casting. And the defect size is going to be proportional to the size of the casting. So that's ingot casting, continuous casting, permanent mold casting. Ingot casting is permanent mold. You basically have a big steel mold. You put some ceramic on the surface. You pour the metal in. But you can do that for small parts, okay? little valves or things. You can do it for, but permanent mold, if you're going to machine that mold, you want to make a lot of parts. It's going to cost you something to machine those molds. So you need to make a few thousand or maybe even 10,000 or 100,000 parts a year if you're going to go to permanent mold. Now, if I want to do one of a kind or a few thousand, I can go to sand casting or something great big where the mold's going to be very expensive. I can go to sand casting and I basically just make a mold with sand and glue the sand together. I take the, typically make a, a wooden model and that wooden model, um, I pack sand around it. So the wooden model is the casting I want to make. I pack sand around it and I have a little parting line. I put a little plate in there, a little piece of sheet metal in between so that I can separate the mold into two, two halves. Okay, and I mix them some binder with the, the sand so it can harden up, and, uh, um, and then I harden the sand, I separate it, take the wooden mold out, put the two halves back together, and pour the metal in. Okay, that's sand casting. Used on little, little bitty parts, um, uh, for example, permanent mold, it might be something like a little valve, a brass valve for plumbing. Uh, sand casting could be something not as high a volume. But sand casting could be something half the size of this room, or even bigger, as far as that goes. Um, and we'll, call, we'll talk about some of the others tomorrow, okay? Different casting technologies. Talking about casting, anybody have any questions before we get started? Talk about ingot casting, and this is the way you make big, heavy forgings or big, heavy parts. Just cast the rectangular piece, and I showed you big, heavy forging of tail shafts and things like that. Start with this big rectangular ingot. Uh, could be four feet by four feet, or something. It could be eight feet by eight feet. The world's largest casting is a 700,000 pound, 350 ton casting, where they make generator rotor forgings. The final part, when you ship it, is about 350 tons. Although I guess I could dig out, again, these things I've showed you before. Um, these, uh, did I mention the, how we got to have these big forging facilities? Here's that. You can still see they put little flutes along the side of the ingot. So this is the ingot. This, here's a person standing here, right? So you can see this is uh, about five feet by, who knows, maybe eight feet across. This is just the mandrel that ends up holding this, okay? And you've got this big chain to, to help hold it. It's going to go into the forging press. That's a good size ingot. They typically flute the edges, again, to get better uh, release so the thing doesn't stick up against one side of the mold, so far as that goes when, you, when you're trying to get it out. So that's ingot casting to make big parts. The, uh, the facilities, there's only two places in the United States that can make these 350 ton generator rotor forges. If you go to a nuclear power plant or a large coal generating power plant, they'll have a generator ro rotor. The largest ones are about 1,000 megawatt electric. So you're talking a gigawatt of power. In the central shaft on this machine, and the machine is a little bit longer this room and a couple stories high, tall. Central shaft, which ends up being about three feet in diameter, is a very high strength steel and it weighs 350 tons. It's just the central shaft. Uh, 
we're limited. We could design 2,000 megawatt generators, but we can't make a shaft big enough. We're limited to about 700 tons for the original casting. Uh, it takes, if you have one of these things, it might be in the furnace for two weeks just coming up to temperature. It's so massive, just to heat, soak the heat all the way through. The reason we have these facilities is U.S. Steel has one and Bethlehem Steel had one. It's now one of the only things that remains in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. These facilities were built prior to World War I to make battleship gun, gun barrels. And they have, you know, they had to make long, big battleship gun barrels, which were massive. And I, the estimate to replace these, this, uh, these facilities today is several billion dollars if we had to put in all the cranes and the lathes and the furnaces. And they have, the furnaces are deep pit furnaces. So you walk up on the ground and there's a furnace in the ground. It just happens to go down about four or five stories. Okay, and it's a big round furnace to heat treat these things. Now, the, to heat treat that at the Ford shop, um, you have this great big furnace that you can drive a railroad car in because that's what you need to, uh, to move these things into and out of the furnace. But then when you get to, after they forged it into a long, a long gun barrel or shaft, basically it goes to the, uh, to the heat treat shop. And the heat treat shop has, you know, lathes with a 100, 100, foot, uh, 100, 100 foot long bed and a 10 foot swing. I mean, these are, it's kind of impressive to see these things. Um, Bethlehem Steel a couple of years ago closed the, their original plant in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but it, I just saw something a couple of weeks ago that suggests that there is a company that took over that facility because it's a unique facility and it would be worth a couple billion dollars. I remember when I was an engineer working for Bethlehem Steel, we were trying to figure out if we could weld two shafts together to make a bigger, a bigger thing. The Soviets have done things like that. It turns out the uh, Europeans do that um, just because they don't have those huge furnace capacity. So they had to develop technology to, develop, to weld uh, things together. And that, that technology, which I saw over in, in Switzerland a, a couple of years ago, is pretty impressive technology too, to weld something that's you know, four, four feet uh, circumference and get a good quality joint. These things are very highly stressed and you end up with flaws in there that are bigger than about a half an inch and you've got serious problems, okay, in terms of the fracture mechanics. And one of the, one of the, if one of those things ever let go, um, you know, when it's rotating at what, 3,600 RPM and it weighs 350 tons, a lot of energy stored in that, okay. In fact, I heard about one of them, I was 20 years ago I was at the airport, I think in Chicago or Milwaukee or something, and this guy from Stone and Webster, we were, we were, our plane was delayed to getting back to Boston, and we were talking. He was there because they had had a failure in a smaller one that uh, was maybe only 150 tons, but it had cracked in two, and it had, um, it had gone through the building, cut through a big solid H-beam that had like two-inch flanges, just cut through it, and it hit the, uh, it hit a, a a hill and just beyond the plant as it went through the building, this one piece, and the piece weighed like 20 tons or something. Um, hit the hill, went sliding up the hill, just plowing dirt the whole way. That made it kind of like a ski ramp, and it went shooting off and it would landed like, you know, a couple miles away. Um, a lot of energy in these things. So you don't want them to fail. Okay, so that's ingot casting. Continuous casting, we talked about, uh, actually that was what helped destroy the U.S. steel industry. In the 1960s, the Japanese, of course, we had bombed out all the steel plants in the world, and the Japanese were rebuilding in the, the, their plants in the 1950s, as were the Europeans. And the Japanese, um, you can say, well, they were, they were clever, or maybe they just, you know, they were in such a bad position, they had to take the risk. Uh, but they put in continuous casting. And the advantage of continuous casting, you don't get this piping defect, remember? The, the shrinkage and the hot top that you have to cut off. In ingot casting, if you're going to make a large part, well, I just told you, you get, you get half a pound. You get 50% yield. You start with 700,000 pounds, you end up with uh, 300, 350,000 pounds, 175 tons or something. Um, so the ja with continuous casting, you're, you, you, have no, you have one end and one beginning, and that they can be a week apart. In fact, I think the Japanese have 
cast half a million or a million pounds of steel all in one continuous casting run, which takes a month or something, you know, uh, of time. Um, before they have to change the molds and things wear out and stuff, you you do have, do have to start start and stop. But now your yields can get to um, in plate material it goes from 50% yield to 75% yield or something like that if you're continuous casting. Although you can only make plate up to about two inches thick by continuous casting because you can't get the deformation in because you're starting off with something that's only about 10 or 12 inches thick. Um, you uh, can make all the sheet material today. Virtually all the sheet material is made by from continuous cast uh, material. In sheet material, you can get yields that are up approaching 90%. Now, you have to stop and think about it. If you go from 50% yield, or actually, the average yield, um, when I worked for Bethlehem Steel and they had a continuous caster at the Burns Harbor plant and one at Sparrows Point, they had a couple of continuous casters. There were maybe 30% continuous casting and 70% ingot casting back 25 years ago when I worked for them. Uh, their overall yield was like in the low 60s or something. The Japanese at that time was probably in the 80%. So, I mean, they, the Japanese were getting a third more production for the same amount of melting and everything. So, no wonder they were beating us. Um, now, that's not to say that the vice president of Bethlehem Steel at the time was an MIT grad, didn't tell Bethlehem Steel when they built Burns Harbor in the mid-60s that, that he told them they should put in continuous casting. But the financial people, oh, it's not a proven technology. And we can't go with an unproven technology. It's too big an investment. You know, well, they only lost their shirt over the next 15 years because they couldn't take the risk. Okay, so it's, it's uh, the problem. Even though the people who knew the technology said, you got to take that risk. You can't just throw away uh, one-third productivity and expect to be able to compete. Uh, so finally, by the, the 1980s, the U.S. steel industry is now up to 85% or something continuous casting. The Japanese are like 97% continuous casting um, or so. Uh, but then for smaller parts, they don't necessarily have to be that much smaller. We can talk about... Um, um, parts that are the size of a small car and can weigh 50 tons, you can go to permanent molds, except the molds get pretty expensive as permanent molds. But the molds are typically steel molds and they're lined with some sort of ceramic. We talked about sand casting yesterday when I don't have to make as many as, as I would with a permanent mold casting to justify the amortized the cost of the mold. I can go to sand casting. I make a wood, wood pattern. I surround it with sand. I put some holes in the sand. I I have something so I can separate the sand, the two halves of the sand. Um, in fact, the two halves of the sand mold are called the cope and the drag. Um, and the, uh, uh, the drag is on the bottom, and the cope is the part that the top goes on. So it's just like a, just, just like a, uh, a cooking pot. You've got a top and a bottom. Um, it actually kind of reminds me of a story uh, back when I was a senior here. Um, Turns out the American Foundries Mint Society supports some students here and gives some scholarships to MIT and other places. And I had one of those scholarships along with another student. Uh, and I was invited to go to their convention, annual convention in Chicago. And uh, they told the story um, with cope and drag, except the way I'd first heard the story was actually a Navy captain who. Uh, Everybody thought this was wonderful. This new captain who was in charge of the, uh, the base would come in and he'd sit at his desk and have a moment of silent meditation each morning. When he thought, well, this is a nice way to start the day. Until one time, his assistant was standing over his shoulder and noticed that he was pulling out the drawer and it said, uh, starboard is right, port is left. Okay. Um, and so he's just preparing himself for the day. Um, but uh, actually, I, they told this story at, uh, at the Foundryman's Convention, and Harvey and I looked at each other. They, only they told us, cope is on the top and drag is on the bottom. And Harvey and I looked at each other, what's a cope, what's a drag? <laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> but anyway, although I'd used them in the uh, foundry, I'd actually done sand casting. Die casting is similar to permanent mold, except you use pressure to squeeze it in. If you're familiar with plastic injection molding, it's the same thing, except it's metal injection molding. You've got a die, and you squeeze the metal in there. And so a lot of parts, like a little brass fitting um, for a uh, 
plumbing fixture. If you're only going to make 50,000 of them, you might make them sand cast. Or if you're in China, where labor is cheap, you might make them sand cast. In the United States, if you're going to make a million of these, you're going to do injection molding. You're going to have a, a permanent mold die, and you're going to squeeze the metal in there under hydraulic pressure uh, or pneumatic pressure, either one. Um, you're going to squeeze it into the die. You'll have water-cooled dies, so it solidifies quickly, and you just pop those parts out of there, um, probably a load every couple of minutes. Uh, lost foam is an interesting technique. Uh, it was actually MIT takes credit. Someone here at MIT takes credit for inventing it, but they weren't the ones who invented it. An artist in the area, um, Al Duca, was an artist. He, still, he was still alive five or six years ago, but he was probably in his 80s. But he was up on the North Shore in Marblehead or somewhere up there. And uh, um, he basically carved something out of styrofoam, packed it with sand, and then just poured the metal in. And the foam vaporizes, the styrofoam vaporizes from the hot metal. So you didn't even have to separate the molds and have two halves of the mold because your foam is just going to vaporize out of the thing. So he had tried casting a couple of art things that he had done. Um, and he brought it to a professor who's actually still here um, in the late 1950s or so and said, uh, can you help us perfect this? And so they did. Uh, right over here in Building 35, they perfected the lost foam casting technology. And it turns out, for the last 15 or 20 years, General Motors has been making almost all their engine blocks that way. So they have a little machine that makes a styrofoam engine block. And then it goes into this great big automated plant. The styrofoam engine block gets covered with sand. They put a hole through it, and they pour the, the cast iron in. The cast iron vaporizes the uh, styrofoam, and you've got your engine block. Okay? Very, very inexpensive. It, it's basically a less expensive way for sand casting. For a long time, Professor Grant, who's retired, actually has Al Duca's, the original casting, which is the, Al Duca's little man and a horse. And for a long time, it was up on the third floor here in one of the display cases. But Professor Grant, a couple of years ago, wanted it back. So, um, But that's kind of the original lost foam uh, piece, if you will. Investment casting, um, take your brass wrap or any class ring. Investment casting goes back to several thousand BC. It's also called lost wax casting. Instead of making styrofoam, back then they didn't have styrofoam. So they would make some part in wax. And basically, you then take that wax part and you dip it in this slurry of ceramic. And the first slurry of ceramic is very, very fine. It's flour. In fact, they call it flour. And then you, each one after that is a little more coarse because you want the gases to be able to escape through the porous uh, mold. You make this mold and it hardens as the uh, solvent in the slurry you know, vaporizes off, usually the solvent's water. But they might be have it dissolved. It might be alcohol. They, they sometimes use polyvinyl alcohol as, as the adhesive to, to bond the, uh, the particles together. Anyway, when you're done, you now have this part that's co covered with uh, uh, ceramic this wax part, you basically then put that in a furnace upside down and you de-wax it. You melt the wax out. And then you end up uh, taking that and just molding it. Uh, that uh, turbine blade I showed you that had all the internal cooling passages, the one that was cut in two, that's lost wax or investment cast. Okay? If you go up here to Henniker, New Hampshire, not Henniker, anyway, somewhere just across the border, there's a, a company... Um, that does a lot of the investment casting for General Motors. Lots of parts that goes on, go on automobiles. Uh, small, precise metal parts. You get lots of detail. I mean, you can, you can read uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology on my ring here. If you, uh, you can't read it. I can't read it with my, with my uh, glasses. But if you take a 5X loop, you can actually read the, uh, the, all the letters. Single crystals. Uh, single crystals. Silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, we have to grow single crystals. Those turbine blades, the best turbine blades, you have to grow single crystals. Why? Because grain boundaries destroy the properties of some things. In the case of silicon and germanium, 
The grain boundaries are places where lots of defects are and you can annihilate the holes. The electrons can basically annihilate the holes and essentially you lose your electrical properties of the, of the semiconductor. So you gotta get rid of the defects, which are the grain boundaries, so you have to grow a single crystal. Um, now some photocells actually still have some grains. They're not pure uh, single crystals, but they have very large grains and so they don't have as many grain boundaries. Okay, so but that's because photocells, you can't afford to grow a single crystal. To grow a single crystal, you actually have to grow very, very slowly. I guess a lot of you are probably familiar with Chakrowski crystal growth, where they make the big, the big ingots, uh, 12 inches in diameter of silicon. And those things may be growing at an inch an hour in a furnace. And this furnace may cost several million dollars. Several million dollars. Uh, so it's, it's kind of pricey. Same type of thing with the high temperature turbine alloys. Investment cast to have these little cores inside, uh, ceramic cores to give them the, uh, the structure on the inside. The problem with the grain boundaries there is at high temperatures, the metals will slip and creep against the grain boundaries. And in fact, what we have here is the first, one of the first super plastically formed parts ever made after the 1930s. Um, if you have lots and lots of grain boundaries in something, it turns out if you just apply a pressure to it, it will creep almost like silly putty or like lead does at room temperature. This happens to be an aluminum zinc alloy. What happened is a professor whose office used to be right around the corner on the first floor named Al Backoff and had a student in the 1960s who was trying to look at the effect of grain size on mechanical properties. And it turns out that they discovered if you got very, very fine grains, the material could be stretched by two, three, four hundred percent in tension without necking down and breaking. Typically, I showed you, I brought in the other day a tensile bar yesterday, and that'll take 40% stretch before it snaps. And that's because it necks down. If you can avoid the necking, well, it turns out if you can get the things to creep at low temperatures, so this this actually um, was one of the first things. They, when they went back in the literature, they found a guy in the Depression, papers in like 1931 and 33, that actually had discovered super plasticity. But everyone else in the world forgot about it. And so in the 60s, Al Backoff and then a couple of his students basically rediscovered super plasticity. They went to one of the silversmiths. There used to be lots of silversmiths around Boston. Okay, uh, Paul Revere, going back to the days of Paul Revere. Okay, but Toll up here in Revere is now closed, but you got uh, uh, Reed and Barton down in Taunton, and you've got, uh, anyway, you've got a, a number of silversmiths around here. They went to some of the silversmiths, and this was basically a mold that they got from one of the candy, that was a, some sort of silver candy dish or something, and they took this sheet of aluminum zinc alloy, and they did this in one single mold. Okay, ordinarily, to get a draw like that, you'd have to use two or three or four molds. They were able to do it from flat sheet to full draw without having the thing neck down. I recovered this from his lab when he left. Um, someone had been using it as an ashtray, so it's got ashes in front of it. I should send this to the Smithsonian. Because, uh, <clears throat> anyway, it uh, has some historical significance. Uh, uh, it can be. It can be fast in a few minutes, or it can be fast in a few hours. Okay, we're going to talk about super plastic forming when I get to. We'll probably talk about it tomorrow when I talk about some of the diffusion bonding that's done with titanium. That was one of the questions that came up, and we'll talk about it um, tomorrow in the second session when I uh, talk about forging, okay, uh, and, and super plastic forming. Um, centrifugal casting, most of what we call ductile iron pipe cast iron pipe for sewers and things like that, uh, if it's not made out of plastic nowadays, is done by centrifugal casting. I've got a tubular section. I have a mold. I pour the metal in while the mold is spinning. Centrifugal force causes it to, to go to the outside. And I don't need an inside mold. And I, so I basically pour it into this permanent mold, which is relatively cold. The metal flows along there. Centrifugal force um, gives me a fairly uniform uh, wall thickness. Um, I don't have an inside mold. I quit pouring the metal. I let it cool down a little bit. I separate the two halves and I got my pipe. And then I start again. 
So you're just spinning the outside mold with no inside mold. Semi-solid, uh, semi-solid fabrication um, was sort of invented by Professor Flemings here at MIT. If I had stayed working for him for another three months that summer, my name would have been on the patent. But um, um, basically, it's just like making ice cream. If you pour ice cream into the freezer and you stir it, it starts to solidify. It starts out as liquid and ends up as mostly solid. Well, it's exactly the same thing. Dave Spencer was a graduate. I was an undergraduate, and Dave Spencer was the graduate student. And Dave had a different type of project, but he had this a piece of equipment where, where he had this little viscometer and he would put molten lead tin alloys in there and then he'd start to cool it from the outside and we'd see the structure as it comes in. Well, you get these dendrites that grow in, these little crystals. And it turns out by stirring it, you broke those up into little round solid pieces inside this liquid matrix. And it's called uh, real casting because you're using rheology to make this slurry in the and the stuff kind of is mushy like a slush, slush cone. A slush cone is the same thing. It's half solid, half liquid. liquid. Liquid surrounding a bunch of solid particles. And so people now, they have fixo casting and rio casting. They're variations, but a lot of auto automotive parts are made this way, particularly in aluminum alloys. They basically stir the stuff as they cool it down. They take it, and then they can forge it into a near net shape because it has this slushy consistency. You forge it, you let it solidify, that last part of the liquid to solidify, and now you got your part in near net shape. So it's sort of combining forging and casting. Uh, but it's a commercial product, process. Um, MIT gave, basically gave away the patents in the 1970s, um, did a lot of stupid things. Most of MIT's current patent, much of MIT's per, current patent policy is based on the mistakes they made with those patents. Okay, and how they gave away the technology. Uh, not they don't want to give it away, but they gave it away to companies in an exclusive way, and those companies for about 10 years sat on it and really didn't pursue it. And so the technology was delayed getting into the marketplace by about 10 years. MIT's philosophy now is we'll, we'll, we'll assign it to you, give you limited exclusive, only in one industry or something, but you've got to show good faith in bringing it to market. The people they gave it to in the 1970s sat on it for about 10, 15 years. And so it, it didn't, didn't get into the market until later. Solid free and poor fabrication has become popular in the last 15, 10 to 15 years. It basically is a way of taking something and, and solidifying it a little bit at a time by adding the metal. It's basically a welding process, if you will, where you basically pour the metal on you can do it with lasers, electron beams, arcs. Um, some people are trying to do it by just semi, some semi-solid. Okay. Oh, okay. This is a, I think it's a piece of manganese bronze. It may actually be on a steel mandrel. Maybe that's why it's bothering the mic. But basically, we started out with a tube, and we went around with electron beam feeding a wire in, and this whole section here is just a bunch of series of weld beads being laid on top. And so we were looking if we could make uh, propellers or other things. I mean, this was just a, um, this was under a Navy-funded project. Um, and you can see some of the defects over here from the wire. Um, or I can bring this tomorrow and pass it around because it's about the end of class today. But in any case, um, remember the size of the flaws is proportional to the size of the casting. In this case, if you're laying down little strips of material and you don't even have a mold, but you're just laying down a weld bead on top of a previous weld bead, the size of the flaws are going to be proportional to the size of those weld beads rather than the size of the whole casting. So uh, that's the idea. It hasn't been commercialized yet. The problem is, does anybody want to spend $10 million for the facility that's going to take to make parts? But the advantage is, is you could design your parts and have all your spares on a computer disk. And when you needed to make a unique part, you put the disk into the machine, and within a week, you could build up a 10-ton casting. might be a slow way to build up a casting, but it's cheaper than having spares, if you're talking about ships and things like that. Because typically, a sand casting of a great big part for a ship may be a one-year delivery time. Okay? Uh, so it's, it's kind of a problem, since your overhauls hopefully don't take that long. <laughs>
Okay, see you tomorrow.